we did we learn about this topic from Children's Oncology Group um, uh, trial 1831. So we know that primary genetic drivers are also very important markers for, markers for risk stratification in pediatric leukemia. Uh, and uh, considering that in the ongoing COG 1831 trial for de novo AML, uh, more than 20 different genetic abnormalities are being tested for by cytogenetic methodologies as well as different molecular assays uh, to determine risk stratification. So these genetic drivers are combined to, uh, with information about minimal residual disease and immunophenotype to divide patients into high risk, and those patients receive three rounds of chemotherapy followed by hematopoietic stem cell transplant, and low-risk patients who receive either four or five rounds of chemotherapy only without stem cell transplant. So because this comprehensive uh, genetic testing is done for every patient in real time, that provides us with unique opportunity to learn not only about genetics of pediatric AML, but also to learn about limitations and advantages of each particular test that we use uh, to investigate discordance, uh, discordant results between different assays and also allow us to do the study that I will be talking about today about frequency and etiology of cytogenetic cryptic rearrangements in pediatric AML. So this slide is showing um, a scheme, a testing scheme for um, risk markers in 1831 study. And you can see that cytogenetic analysis is done in, in local institutional labs. And in addition to karyotype analysis, it also in, includes required fish panel consisting of KMT2 and NUP98 breakapart probes and dual fusion probes for translocation A21 and inversion 16. Molecular Oncology Lab tests for several DNA sequence mutations, and Foundation Medicine tests for multiple abnormal fusions and some additional sequence variants, and Hematologics Lab uh, tests for minimal residual disease and RAM immunophenotype, and all this information is then reviewed, and discrepancies are resolved, it's entered into a COG database, um, and the risk is assigned for every patient. A very important feature of this study is that every genetic um, marker that's um, used for prognosis has to be confirmed by two independent methods. And that's how it came to our attention very early on that very often molecularly detected fusions did not have confirmation from our cytogenetic studies and we had to do additional workup. So that's how we decided to do formal evaluation. What is actual frequency of cytogenetic cryptic rearrangements um, in this patient population of pediatric AML? So before I uh, re start reviewing the data, I just want to go over how we classified cases based on visibility of cytogenetic abnormalities. So all cases that had molecularly detected fusions were based on cytogenetics divided into those that were visible with typical expected rearrangements, those that were visible but had variant rearrangement, most often three-way or four-way translocation. Uh, but we still could uh, decipher what was the primary abnormality. Then cases that were cryptic by karyotype only, but were detected by study required fish, and that included cases um, that had completely normal karyotype, cases that had non-specific cytogenetic abnormalities, and cases that had so complex karyotypes that we could not actually decipher what the primary abnormality was. And then the last category were cases that were cryptic, not only by karyotype, but also by, G, uh, by, by fish. Uh, although the, uh, the fish probe that was uh, expected to detect abnormality was included into a required fish panel. We also divided cryptic abnormalities based on chromosomal mechanism uh, to those that were intrinsically cryptic, where we expected that they will not be detectable by karyotype because the gene partners are either too terminally located on their corresponding chromosome arms, or they were very close to each other on the same arm, so the fusion was formed by a very small deletion that was cytogenetically cryptic. And then the second group were those cases where we expected them to be visible by cytogenetics. However, there were still two subgroups there. Uh, those that uh, were due to incompatible gene orientation, simple translocation cannot form diffusion. So for those, we were prepared that they will often be complex or they will have high frequency of variants. Then they, we expected those to be challenging by uh, cytogenetics. Uh, example is KMT2 MLLT10. 
And then the second groups were those that can be formed, where fusion can be formed by a simple translocation, where we know that sometimes sporadically you still get variant rearrangements like small insertions, but that was expected to happen with very low frequency. So what were the results? We reviewed cases from July of 2020, with, where, uh, when, when this study started, um, until July 2023, and there was about 700 cases. Of those, there were 450 cases where gene fusion was detected by molecular studies. So of those 450, 109 were not picked up by cytogenetics, were uh, cytogenetically cryptic, which was more than 24%, or quarter of all the cases. This was much higher than we anticipated. Uh, of those, uh, 10, about 10% 10 were the, the ones that we, where we expected they will be cryptic, um, and that was uh, something we planned for and included appropriate fish probes in the required fish panel. The issue were 15% of those where we expected the cytogenetics will be informative, uh, but was still not able to pick up abnormalities, and that prompted a, a lot of additional workup, a lot, a lot of additional fish testing, and a lot of extra work uh, for uh, participating COG laboratories. The other uh, unexpected finding was that in close to 3% of the cases, uh, abnormalities were now missed not only by karyotype, but also by fish probe, which was designed to be able to pick up the abnormality. In most of the cases, or I should say all the cases, it was a KMT to a break apart probe uh, missing the uh, rearrangement. Uh, another interesting finding was that frequency of cryptic cases was very different um, in different abnormalities. Uh, so the abnormalities that were expected to be cryptic um, were indeed um, not detectable by karyotype, um, but they were easily detectable by uh, break-apart probes uh, that were included into required fish panel. Uh, the biggest surprise was KMT to a MLLT10, because although we expected that this will be a very challenging abnormality, uh, we did not anticipate that it would be quite this challenging. Uh, first, we had 53 cases um, of KMT2A um, MLLT10, meaning that this is a very common abnormality in pediatric AML. And of those, 32 could not be deciphered by karyotype analysis. Um, and of all the cryptic ones, eight were also missed by KMT2A break apart probe. The other abnormalities that were more frequently cryptic than we anticipated were also MLLT10 fusion with partners other than KMT2A. KMT2A with partners other than MLLT10, especially KMT2A MLLT4 that I singled out, and also DEC NAP214. In contrast, some translocations were never cryptic um, in this case series. Uh, RUNX1, RUNX1T1, and uh, CBFB MYH11 were always picked up by karyotype. And so we, other than KMT2 MLLT10, where we um, know that it's, it's um, uh, very challenging often, uh, we don't understand for all these other cases why this, the, where is this um, striking difference in their propensity to be formed through variant and cryptic rearrangements, and there's probably some interesting biology there that could be uh, studied further. Uh, because KMT2 MLLT10 was particularly challenging, I wanted to show some examples. Uh, so uh, these cases were uh, very often, as I mentioned, missed, uh, either because they were um, completely, there were no signs of, uh, of rearrangement um, of the um, uh, relevant LOSA, or they were too complex um, to be deciphered. Uh, so I have examples of both of these scenarios um, uh, on the slide. Um, and this is an example of a case that was too complex to really see what was the primary abnormality. And this other example, there was no, there were no any sign of involvement of either KMT2A or MLLT10 locus. And KMT2A break apart fish was also negative, and we assumed that this was a fusion formed by very, very small insertion. And I also wanted to quickly show examples of some other um, rearrangements that were more frequently cryptic than we anticipated. Uh, on, on the left side, we have MLLT10 fusion with partner with other than KMT2A, in this case PCAM, but was too complex to be decipherable. Um, and then on the right side, we have KMT2A with MLLT4 with completely normal karyotype, normal KMT2A break apart fish. Uh, with array, we saw a very small duplication and small deletion in corresponding genes, so there was probably a very small insertion. Uh, of MLLT4 into um, KMT2A locus. 
So what did we learn from this analysis about the ways we could enhance detection of cryptic rearrangements? We think that we could improve our FISH strategy, uh, that we can use more chromosomal microarray testing, and that we can use new technologies like optical genome mapping. In terms of improving FISH strategy, since KMT2 MLLT10 was particularly challenging, we think that upfront, including KMT2 MLLT10 dual fusion probe or MLLT10 break apart probe, would be very helpful. And indeed, in all the cases where this, these probes um, could be used, um, they were picking up abnormalities that were missed by karyotype and uh, KMT2 break apart. CMA also showed utility in these cryptic cases. In 18 cryptic cases where it was run, and out of 18 cryptic cases, in 13 it was informative, um, showing breakpoint deletions and duplications. And in here I have a case um, of NUP98 NSD1 fusion with small duplications detected by CMA involving both of these partner genes. And finally, we really think that optical genome mapping has potential to detect these cryptic rearrangements. We did a small pilot study at CHLA, including 13 cases of pediatric AML that were cryptic by karyotype, and in all 13 cases, an optical genome mapping detected the abnormality. And, and I decided to show KMT, two KMT2A MLLT10 cases again because this was a very, a very um, challenging abnormality. Uh, so this first example was a completely normal karyotype AML with KMT2A break apart being negative. However, optical genome mapping showed a very small insertion um, of KMT2A into MLLT10 locus. It was only 74 KBs, so that was too small even for the KMT2A break apart probe. And this second case was an example of a complex rearrangement. So here we had a karyotype that showed insertion of 11Q into 7P, and there was no any signs of involvement of 10P locus where um, MLLT10 is. However, by optical mapping, this was actually shown to be insertion of 11Q into 10P, uh, and this insertion formed a fusion at this breakpoint B, and then this entire region, this entire cassette was inserted into 7P, which is the only thing that we saw by karyotype analysis. So optical genome mapping not only detected the fusions, but also showed the mechanism how these rearrangements formed the corresponding fusions. So in conclusion, we showed that cryptic rearrangements accounted for 24% of the driver fusions um, in this pediatric AML population. We detected abnormalities that are common in AML, which are either always cryptic or are much more frequently cryptic than we anticipated. And we also detected abnormalities that were cryptic not just by karyotype, but also by KMT2A break apart probe, specifically MLLT10 KMT2A and some other KMT2A fusions. And then we um, identified some uh, approaches that will uh, help us in this and future studies to enhance pathogenetic detection uh, of cryptic rearrangements, including upfront up, up fish with MLLT10 dual uh, break apart probe or KMT2 MLLT10 dual fusion probe, uh, utilization of CMA in cases where fish is negative or unavailable. Uh, and then using optical genome mapping, which shows very promising results in detection of visible and cryptic fusions. And so we are proce proceeding with additional larger studies um, to substantiate that further. So I would like to finish by thanking COG AML Committee, COG, uh, COG Cytogenetics Committee, and in the first place, all the participating COG labs that do tons of work for these cases. So thank you very much.